Imagine you're a teenager who straight out of high school declared for the 2001 NBA draft and you're selected by the Chicago Bulls, a team that's been rudderless since the end of the Jordan era. You get drafted fourth overall, and your draft comp, which is still up on draft.net, is Shaquille O'Neal. And this was the year after Shaq's monstrous MVP season. You've been deemed along fellow rookie Tyson Chandler to be the player who will usher in the next era of Bulls basketball. Now, what if I tell you that by the end of the story, you end up with your house being foreclosed and a daughter you never met was shot dead? Today, we are going to answer the question of what happened to Eddie Curry. To those who aren't familiar with the Stocky Center, we can't really blame you. For many, Eddie Curry represents the dark ages for two of the league's most celebrated franchises, the aforementioned Bulls and the New York Knicks. Curry has been a somewhat obscure name on many top 10 NBA lists for things that you'd rather not be remembered for. Top 10 worst signings, top 10 NBA draft bust, top 10 fattest players, Eddie is likely to appear somewhere on those. Thankfully, Eddie's memory in the league has started because since his stay in New York, he's been held in the same regard as Kwame Brown, as the butt of many NBA jokes. This includes comments from famous sports commentator Stephen A. Smith, who has gone on multiple rants ridiculing the man, questioning his heart, and making fun of his weight. And this is just the basketball rock bottom that Curry reached which if you ask him now is absolutely nothing compared to what he's had to deal with off the court. But before we explore the downfall of the former fourth overall pick, let's look at him when he was viewed as having one of the higher upsides in the league. At the age of 19, Curry averaged forgettable numbers in limited minutes for the Bulls. Part of this was due to his age, but also the Bulls roster construction. While this was indeed the dark age for the Bulls, it wasn't because they couldn't amass talent. The problem was it was that all of that talent was at the same position. During Curry's rookie season, he had to split time with a 19-year-old future All-NBA center Tyson Chandler and 25-year-old two-time All-Star Brad Miller. Even the year before, the Bulls had a 21-year-old Elton Brand who in his first two seasons with them averaged 20 points and 10 rebounds whom they would then trade for the previously mentioned Tyson Chandler. This obviously stunted some of Curry's development, and even when they traded away Miller during his rookie season and tried playing Curry at the four next to Chandler, it didn't work. Neither of them were excellent shooters, and both of them were extremely raw talents that needed support from the rest of the roster. They ended up finishing with only 21 wins and landed the second pick in the draft which they spent on one of the most tragic what-if players in league history, Jay Williams, who suffered a motorcycle accident after his rookie year that ended his career. An upside of Eddie Curry's second year, however, was that he led the league in field goal percentage at .585%. This was the first time a Chicago Bull had led the league in a major statistical category since Jordan's retirement. Curry compounded on this improvement over the next two years until ultimately leading the Bulls to the playoffs in 2005. This was the first time the Bulls qualified since Jordan and looked to be the moment Curry would start making his mark on the league. But this was actually the moment when his career began to take a turn for the worse. During a game in March that season, Curry complained of chest pains and lightheadedness. Normally, this might not seem too alarming, but they were both symptoms of a possible heart arrhythmia. While for the general public, these symptoms seemed to come out of nowhere, the Bulls organization had heard Curry complain to them all the way back in training camp that year. He was actually taken to the hospital due to the symptoms when they flared up during a conditioning drill. The Bulls, now airing on the side of caution, benched the big man for the remainder of the season, including the playoffs, where the Bulls lost to the Wizards in the first round. This was the beginning of a public controversy surrounding Curry and his condition. This was particularly bad for the young center as he was a restricted free agent that year. He had an impressive year, averaging 16 points and 5.8 rebounds. The 22-year-old was looking for a major salary increase. Regarding these numbers, remember that this took play during the slowest-paced era in NBA history, 
Points and boards were never harder to come by, so his numbers at the time warranted the pay bump he felt entitled to. Things reached a stalemate when the Bulls wanted Curry to get DNA tested to see if he was predisposed to a condition called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, a thickening of the heart muscle that has been linked to other young athletes' sudden death. Curry refused, stating that he had already been cleared by the doctors to play. Neither side budged, so Curry was involved in a sign-and-trade to the Knicks. This seemed to be a great move for him, especially with the six-year, $60 million contract, which at the time was a pretty sizable contract. It looked like Curry could get a fresh start and continue to build on the growth he had made the year before. While his first year with the New York team was lackluster, his second was the best of his whole career. Averaging 19.5 points and 7 rebounds, he realized the potential that the Bulls scouting department saw in him. Sadly, next year his production fell and the year after that to 13-5, and, and the year that he played only three games, he averaged a total of 1.7 points a game and only 1.3 rebounds. Purely from a basketball perspective, Curry infuriated his coaches. Despite being 7 feet tall and weighing 295 pounds, which would make him the second heaviest player in the league today behind only the 7'5 Taco Fall, his rebounding and rim protection were awful. One coach in particular, Scott Skiles, was asked about what Curry needed to do to become a better rebounder. The coach answered with only one word, jump. It wasn't just his perceived lack of effort that earned his coach's ire. Curry year after year showed up to training camp out of shape, which would put players far better than he was in the coach's doghouse. To make matters worse, the new Knicks coach was Mike D'Antoni, a coach famous for his up-tempo offense that required high-energy big man to run it as well. Eddie spent most of the rest of his Knicks tenure on the bench. Given his substantial contract and the infamous New York fan base, Curry became the face of the franchise's failure. As if he didn't have enough bad press due to his game, his personal life became the focus of New York and in turn, national media. And this is where we leave the game of basketball behind for a little bit. Ah, but before we do, we'd like to remind you that you can win a free piece of merch from our partner, Ultra Game. All you have to do is subscribe to this channel and the Ultra Game channel, like this video, and drop a comment with the name of your favorite team or player. In 2009, Eddie Curry's personal driver filed a suit against him. He claimed that he accumulated $98,000 in unpaid wages and had also demanded $5 million in damages due to the sexual harassment he had received from Curry. Needless to say, this sparked a major controversy. The driver's claim was that Curry exposed himself to him as well as propositioned him for sex. He also accused Curry of using racial slurs against him, all the while threatening him with a gun to keep him quiet about their affairs. Curry denied any and all allegations. A federal judge dismissed the lawsuit and sent it to arbitration. You'd hope that'd be the worst thing to happen to him during his career, but it was far from it. A few weeks after receiving his suit during a road game against the Sixers, Curry was sitting on the bench. Mid-game, he gets told to head back to the locker room, where he finds one of his friends crying. His friend tells him that he needs to call his assistant, and when he does and asks him what's up, his assistant says, bro, Nova is dead, bro, they killed her. His assistant was at the scene of the shooting where his ex-girlfriend was shot, and he said, I'm here on the scene now, there's blood everywhere, bro, I think the baby may be dead too. Nova wasn't alone during the shooting. She was with her and Curry's children, a 10-month-old girl and a 3-year-old boy. Both Nova and her daughter died in the shooting. Following that traumatizing time of his life, his career continued to fizzle out. His hardships didn't end there as Curry was $2 million in debt. He had made roughly $57 million over his career, making him another cautionary tale for upcoming professional athletes. He defaulted on a nearly $600,000 loan. He claimed that he shouldn't have to pay it because he has too many expenses. He had lost thousands to family and friends taking advantage of him, as well as his immaturity coming straight out of high school, leading to stupid spending. Finally, after a short stint in a couple of foreign leagues, Curry retired from being a professional basketball player. If there's any ray of hope in a story, it's how he managed to get his life together long after leaving the game. His wife Patrice has been his rock through all of his turbulence and has helped him raise his seven children. 
including his son that survived the shooting. With her as an anchor, he has grown up and become a better person. He has remarked about the many jokes that are made at his expense saying, and on those days when I for some reason get sucked into the comment section online and end up seeing some of the stuff people still say about me all these years later, all I have to do is look across the room at my children or at Patrice and I instantly realize the difference between what's not important and what is. And that is it for our video today. What do you think? Have you come to think of Eddie Curry in a different way? Do you think that there's a line that fans shouldn't cross when making fun of a player? Let us know in the comments below. Also, don't forget to leave a like if you enjoyed the video and subscribe if you'd like more videos like this uploaded daily. We will see you next time.